This is the story of the power of a river. Salmon are in trouble. We have so much at stake. The, the possible extinction of the king salmon. We are tied to this river by blood. The taking of the river, the impact to our salmon, the desecration of sites that are important to us. This is cultural trauma. The people of Seattle and Seattle City Light have no intention of exploiting the people in the Skagit Valley, the tribes that, that make their home there and, and who have established their way of life there. They've taken a lot from, from this tribe for the last hundred years and, and, and the tribe is not gonna take it anymore. skyline behind me is partially lit up by power generated 100 miles away from here on the Skagit River. That's where Seattle City Light operates three dams for hydropower. Well, that's pretty much out of sight, out of mind for people here. But tribes that live in the Skagit Valley and federal regulators say that project is hurting fish and Native American ways of life and that something needs to change. It sounds like you feel as though the city of Seattle has stolen this river from you. Absolutely, yeah. They've, they've taken a lot from, from this tribe for the last hundred years, and, and, and the tribe is not gonna take it anymore. The Skagit River is one of the treasures of the Pacific Northwest. It's the largest river in western Washington, the only one that's home to all five species of Puget Sound salmon. It's the number one food source for the beloved orca. And it is, without question, the heart of the Upper Skagit Indian tribe. Our people have resided in the Upper Skagit Valley for literally 10,000 years now. Scott Schuyler is the Natural Resources Director of the Upper Skagit Tribe, which is based in Cedar Woolley. The Skagit River is the lifeblood of my people. The salmon are also part of that lifeblood. Nearly a century ago, major change came to the free-flowing Skagit. Seattle City Light built three massive dams in the middle of it for hydropower. Since then, the Skagit powers up about 20% of Seattle's lights at a bargain price. City Light customers pay less than half of what residents do in cities such as San Diego, New York, and Boston. And that's great. Who doesn't want inexpensive power that doesn't cause air pollution? But that's not the whole story. In a three-month investigation involving dozens of interviews and a review of more than 1,000 pages of government records, the King 5 investigators have found there's a very dark side of generating light here on the Skagit River. The utility denies it's to blame, but since the feds last relicensed Seattle's dams in 1995, three species of Skagit fish have landed on the endangered species list, bull trout, steelhead, and Chinook salmon. And in 2005, orcas who depend on Chinook salmon from the Skagit to survive were also listed as endangered. It's well documented by federal agencies that dams can hurt fish by blocking off habitat they need to spawn and grow. Seattle's dams choke off nearly 40% of the entire river. A river the Upper Skagit say is the soul of their culture. They call themselves salmon people, but with salmon sliding toward extinction, the tribe says Seattle is exploiting all that to them is sacred. The taking of the river the impact to our salmon, the desecration of sites that are important to us. This is cultural trauma. Is the city of Seattle exploiting indigenous people for hydropower, for cheap power? I can absolutely tell you that the people of Seattle and Seattle City Light, have, we have no intention of of exploiting uh, the, the, the people in the Skagit Valley, the tribes that, that make their home there and, and who have established their way of life there. Deborah Smith is the CEO of Seattle City Light. She says they have a responsibility to their ratepayers, but also to the tribes affected by their business. If they feel exploited, then that's something we have to work on. Our commitment is to continue to learn, to have an open mind, and as we do so, to change, change our position. In public messages about the Skagit dams, City Light says they're helping, not hurting fish. They label themselves the nation's greenest utility, environmental stewards to mother nature. We operate our hydro projects 
works in a fish first manner. On top of that, the city says they're not harming salmon because the fish never lived that far up the river anyway, even before their dams went in. They say steep canyons and enormous boulders form an effective natural fish barrier. This is where Seattle City Light and their science says there's no way that right there fish could get past that boulder. In your scientific opinion, is that true? No, not at all. John Paul Shanahan is the Upper Skagit Tribe's top biologist. He says for decades, the utility has gotten away with not providing a way for fish to get over their dams, like building a fish ladder, by sticking to their guns. That historically, salmon couldn't swim past the nature-made obstacles below their dams. What is your reaction to that? It's kind of like big tobacco, when they used to say smoking's not bad for you. It's like Big Hydro saying fish never got up here. It's the Pacific Northwest. Fish swim upstream. That's what they do. This is not an insurmountable barrier to salmon. Key for the Upper Skagit, they want Seattle to conduct a study to find out if fish ever swam past the entire dam area. If it turns out they could, Seattle may be on the hook to spend millions of dollars building a fish passage system. So far, the city will not agree to the study. We're asking them to join with us on a, on a scientific inquiry about fish. I don't know what's so dangerous about that. The Upper Skagit Indian tribe isn't alone in its demand for a study. Public records show every single agency involved with a damming project agrees with them. U.S. Fish and Wildlife, the State Department of Fish and Wildlife, National Marine Fisheries Service, the National Park Service, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, the State Department of Ecology, the Swinomish and Sauk Suatl tribes, and more. All these groups on one side, with only the city of Seattle on the other, so far refusing to agree to a comprehensive study on fish passage. Only Seattle, the one agency with a financial interest here saying something else. I mean, what does that say to you? Well, it says we need to listen more and we are starting that process. That's what we're doing. We're listening and we're going to approach the discussion with a completely open mind. The small Upper Skagit tribe knows they're up against a powerful city and utility, but they say they won't stop fighting until they get their river and salmon back. The schedule to help build Seattle into probably the greatest city on the West Coast. And uh, we have an expectation now that that's returned to the Skagit. The Skagit is in desperate need of help right now. And we're hoping the city government now sees fit to start looking at a return to the Skagit and helping us rebuild the Skagit to the greatest river in the Puget Sound. What is your reaction to their change in position? Well, I think, you know, mostly I'm, I'm pleased to see movement in that regard. Scott Schuyler is the policy representative of the Upper Skagit Indian Tribe, whose ancestors have lived along the Skagit River for centuries. He says today's development provides a glimmer of hope. That's all we have right now. We do not have our fish. These runs are depleted. Our fisheries, our culture, everything's being degraded. To what extent by the hydropower? We don't know yet. We hope to accomplish that. The three dams operated by Seattle City Light to generate electricity for the citizens of Seattle is surrounded in heated controversy, mostly over whether Seattle is doing enough to help fish impacted by their project, like Chinook and Steelhead, which are sliding toward extinction. The utility's license to operate the nearly 100-year-old dams is about to expire. And in talks on how to better help fish under a new license, the city has been at odds with every other stakeholder involved in the project. Process, including the Upper Skagit Indian Tribe, the National Park Service, the U.S. Department of Fish and Wildlife, the National Marine Fisheries Service, and more. The biggest concern? The city's refusal to look at building a fish passage system, like a fish ladder, over all three of their dams. Currently, there's nothing in place that allows salmon to get above or below their project. Now, for the first time, city light officials are agreeing to study the possibility. I think we're, we're moving in that right direction, but right now we have a ways to go. This 
is the story of the power of a river. When Seattle started building dams on the Skagit River more than 100 years ago, nobody was too worried about salmon. The project was a win. Cost-effective hydroelectricity for the people of Seattle. All aboard. Ladies and gentlemen, your cruise is going to take you four and a half miles back into the mountains. The operation was an engineering marvel. Tourists flocked to see it. There she is, Ross Dam. One of the highest in the world. But in the 80s, a big change. Congress passed a law mandating dam operators must think not only about generating power, but also how their dams hurt fish and wildlife and fix it. If necessary, build a system to help fish get over their dams. But Seattle didn't engineer any help to get fish over their dams because... They lucked out. They held up science showing by coincidence their dams were built in a perfect place where fish couldn't migrate anyway. We think we've looked at the, the data objectively. Jeff Fisher is City Light's senior aquatic ecologist. In the last two weeks, he and other city officials agreed to study the idea of fish passage for what are known as anadromous fish, like salmon, species that go out to sea and come back to the river to spawn. At the same time, they wrote, based on the city science, anadromous fish are not affected by their operation. Those reports, uh, they essentially are one of the lines of evidence that indicate that there's, there was no observations of anadromous fish, uh, anadromous salmon or steelhead in the upper basin. The King 5 investigators have found the city has been hanging its hat on this science. Two studies the utility paid for 33 years ago, and this one from 100 years ago, Smith and Anderson, 1921. Smith and Anderson boated around the Skagit and observed low falls and rapids that could stop salmon. And locals told them they'd never seen salmon more than a mile above what is now the town of New Halem. Their study from 1988 includes interviews with homesteaders such as Glee Davis, who said there's an awful lot of rapids below the dams and salmon never make it to a place like that. Study authors also interviewed a Seattle City Light train conductor who said, to the best of his knowledge, only a few steelhead have ever made it past the barriers in the river. Is that the kind of science you think you should be relying on when we're talking about something so important as a species, different species of fish that are headed toward extinction? Absolutely. It's important to be interviewing the local citizens that are living in the basin and that have some... Uh, some history and understanding of what what was there. A hundred years later, we can do better. Tom O'Keefe is an aquatic ecologist who also sits on the Environmental Advisory Board for Seattle City Light. We need to shift from this place of just looking at stories from a hundred years ago and pivot to a modern understanding of how fish moving up and down river systems and what we need to do to quantify that. What do you think about the science they're using? It's no good. It's old. It's not true. John Paul Shanahan is a top biologist for the Upper Skagit Indian tribe. He says new science could be expensive for the city. Building a way to help fish get over their dams would cost millions of dollars. It makes me angry because we're not using science. We're using financial incentives. This is where City Light for years has said their science concludes the landscape is so rough, fish can't use this habitat anyway, making it harmless to let the river go completely dry, leaving a two and a half mile stretch of the Skagit River with no river in it. Why is that? The utility blasts the river through a mountain, a man-made tunnel 11,000 yards long, creating more force and electricity as water hits the power plant below. But once in a while, for maintenance reasons or when there's a ton of rain, the utility does this. They spill water into the dry riverbed below. And in the last few years when that's happened, guess what tribal and government scientists have seen. There she is. Look at that. Beautiful. That's right, fish. That's 2019 cell phone video of a Chinook salmon spawning in the river where normally City Light doesn't allow the river to be. And in 2016, government biologist snorkeling spotted this, a steelhead swimming in a place it wasn't supposed to be able to get to. It was huge. 
I mean, it's a, it's a complete and utter game changer. It facilitated a lot of conversations about what we know and what we don't know and what science and what's folklore. And, and it's, yeah, it, it's a, it was a big day. The city holds up one more piece of science to show their dams aren't damaging salmon. This 2019 genetic study by scientists from U.S. Fish and Wildlife and Seattle City Light, who paid for it. Their work shows barriers likely prevented fish passage long before the dams existed. But a slew of government scientists quickly lined up criticizing those results. In public records, the National Park Service said this is an artificial narrative contrary to current state of the science. U.S. Fish and Wildlife wrote it doesn't show the full picture. And the State Department of Fish and Wildlife slammed it, saying the report is laden with inadequacies and doesn't form any realistic conclusions. Yes, yeah, scientists can disagree. And uh, they, they disagree all the time. No one disagrees that many factors contribute to salmon disappearing on the Skagit. Ocean conditions, climate change, development, predators. As for Seattle, government agencies and tribes say they just want the city to do its part. We're not trying to blame everything on them. That wouldn't make any sense. But we're asking them to come to the table to identify their own impacts and help us fix it. 100 miles of power lines begin on the Skagit River and run through three counties to deliver electricity to Seattle. And along the way, the public utility has delivered a message to citizens that's as bright and shiny as the city skyline it helps light up. Despite three giant dams in the middle of the river, in news releases, web pages, and signage, City Light assures its customers not to worry about their operation hurting fish and wildlife, such as salmon. The Skagit is the only river that's home to all five species of Puget Sound salmon. And on the web, Seattle City Light says their stewardship means inexpensive hydroelectricity for you and a healthy salmon population for the Skagit. Take chum salmon. City Light calls the species a success on the Skagit, saying salmon are responding to our efforts. Chum are extremely healthy. Since 1985, seeing an eight-fold increase. And in 2002, a return of 210,000 chum was the largest return on record. An eight-fold increase in chum salmon. That sounds good. That sounds incredibly good. We showed Lori Winnemiller, a 30-year City Light customer, a collection of the utilities' messages meant for people like her, their ratepayers. What would be your takeaway if you I, just saw that on its face? I would think that it is incredibly successful, as they're saying on the front page, and I would think, wow, somehow this has made things possibly even better than it was before. Seattle City Light is right. 2002 was an epic year for Chum Salmon, but that was nearly... 20 years ago, the King 5 investigators have found the city's rave reviews of their impact on Skagit River salmon are outdated and incomplete. After that banner year for chum, according to data from the state, those salmon runs severely declined. In 2019, just over 3,000 fish came back. From 2002, that's a 67-fold decrease, not an 8-fold increase the city left on its website. Well, that feels incredibly deceptive to me and um, irresponsible because we need to know what the impact is. We're really not getting the full picture here. Seattle doesn't give the full picture about Chinook salmon either. On the web, they highlight strong returns of Chinook salmon, 25,000 coming back to the Skagit in 2004, held as a landmark event, the largest return in 25 years. Here's what City Light didn't say. Since then, Chinook have steadily decreased on the Skagit. In 2019, 11,800 came back, less than half of the record number Posted by the utility. I feel like they are um, painting a rosy picture to allow us to believe that everything is fine. Salmon are in trouble. Ed Eliezer is the regional fish manager for the Washington State Department of Fish and Wildlife. To say that things are all rosy here on the Skagit River sounds like that is not the real story. Not the real story at all. If things were rosy, you'd be hearing 
you know, steelhead jumping and people would be fishing, but we're- Right now. Right, right now, today, and this was a stronghold for the Puget Sound. Is Seattle City Light misleading the public with the, the way that you are portraying the situation on your website? You've shared some information with me that causes me to want to go back and take a look and make sure that we are being transparent. Deborah Smith is the general manager and CEO of Seattle City Light, which dubs itself the nation's greenest utility. I can tell you we are not attempting to mislead, but if we don't have the current information or a full picture, we could in fact be having that impact without intending to. Federal agencies have long determined that dams hurt fish by blocking off river habitat they need for spawning and maturing. But Seattle City Light says that's not the case on the Skagit because, according to them, fish can't swim past large boulders and steep grades below their dams anyway. Website messages and signs greeting the public ask, what about the fish? The answer, no problem. Rapids below their dams serve as an effective natural fish barrier. State and federal regulators say that's not the correct message. In public documents, NOAA Fisheries writes they've concluded no insurmountable barrier exists that would stop fish from getting through the dam area. And scientists from the National Park Service write they haven't found any evidence of a fish passage barrier below Seattle's dams. We're ratepayers, so we're stockholders, we're shareholders, and they need to do what's right by the citizens. Oh, 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 eh. oh, 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 eh. According to the Upper Skagit Indian tribe, they are eternally tied to the Skagit River and the salmon that swim in it. We are a salmon people and and salmon mean more than just money, more than just food. It's a way of life for us. We are tied to this river by blood. Larry Peterson's ancestors lived along the Skagit for 10,000 years, where salmon formed the center of their nutritional, spiritual, and community bonds. Oh, oh, oh. But the salmon are disappearing, heading toward extinction. It's heartbreaking. We are a river tribe. I really feel like it's ending a way of life for us. My, I, my children are robbed of that cultural aspect. 100 years ago, when the city of Seattle built three dams on the Skagit to generate electricity, no one consulted the Native Americans, and that's created painful consequences. For example, the utility built its company town of New Halem on Upper Skagit ancestral burial grounds. City Light has dried up a three-mile section of the Skagit where it used to flow freely, and this is the stretch of the river the tribe considers the most sacred of all, what they call their Spirit Valley. Also, the city's dams flooded important cultural sites, sites now ruined underwater. My children are losing what they're entitled to. They're entitled to be on this river. They're entitled to the time they have here with Mother Nature and their family. This is where those entitlements began in 1855 in Mukilteo, where the U.S. and Puget Sound Indian chiefs signed the Treaty of Point Elliot. The tribes gave away their lands to the federal government peacefully and in exchange retained one critical right. The right to fish as they had for centuries. In the treaty, it says the right of taking fish at usual and accustomed grounds and stations is further secured to said Indians. It's the supreme law of the land. Professor Charles Wilkinson from the University of Colorado is one of the country's foremost authorities on Indian law, history, and policy. He says fishing was the deal breaker, the one part of their culture the tribes weren't willing to give up. So we end up with, with that promise being that, that that way of life would be continued. With salmon in serious decline, the Upper Skagit tribe rarely gets to exercise their treaty rights. They've gone from fishing 79 total days in 1980 to only six days in all of 2017. And since then, it hasn't gotten much better. 
scientists from three tribes and federal agencies say Seattle's dams, which block off nearly 40% of the river, are a big part of the salmon problem. The agencies include NOAA Fisheries, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, and the National Park Service. The only scientists on record saying the dams aren't part of the problem work for Seattle City Light. Growing up with this stigma around Native Americans was hard. 20-year-old Janelle Schuyler's life changed two years ago when her dad brought her to the tribe's Spirit Valley, the portion of the river where City Light diverts the water out of the river. And it really hurt me on an emotional level, like at a deep, on a deep emotional level. And I wanted to seek out to Mary Dirk and, and wonder why, it, like, why she allows this. So she wrote the city's top boss, Mayor Jenny Durkin. Dear Mayor Durkin, I'm writing today to share my feelings with you and ask some questions regarding the three hydroelectric dams. She asked the mayor for help on the Skagit to urge the city's public utility to own up to the impacts caused by their dams. I asked this for my people. I asked this for the salmon. I asked this for our sacred Skagit. Janelle also asked to meet with the mayor in person. That was in 2019. And to date... Nothing. Yeah. Nothing at all. The mayor didn't respond to our most recent interview request, but City Light CEO Deborah Smith answered our questions. The tribe feels like the city is ignoring their concerns and has done so for about 10 years. What do you say to that? Really all I can do, Suzanne, is promise that going forward, uh, our goal is to make sure that all the folks involved in this process with us, but particularly the tribes who do have treaty rights, that they feel listened to and heard. Smith admits the utility's done a poor job of communicating with the tribe in the past, but she vows to change that. You know, what we're doing today is we're attempting to move forward to repair what we can. The Treaty of Point Elliot was signed by the Upper Skagit's ancestor, Chief Pateus. It's also signed by Chief Seattle, the city's namesake, the most famous Pacific Northwest Indian chief of all. On the era of social justice, this is a huge injustice to the, to the tribe and to our people. The tribe's policy director, Scott Schuyler, says the city is being hypocritical. Chief Seattle, signer of the treaty promising fishing rights, is the face of the city of Seattle and the logo of Seattle City Light. There's a, a, a large amount of hypocrisy here that, that, uh, that they need to come to terms with. I mean, you can talk the talk, but you're not walking the walk. You need to look in the mirror here, Seattle. These are members of the Upper Skagit Indian tribe fishing with nets, a custom that dates back centuries. For many, this sparks outrage. Sports fishers and others accuse tribes of abusing their treaty rights, overfishing, and unfairly using gill nets, contributing to the devastating decline in salmon. On the Skagit River, Chinook salmon and steelhead are headed toward extinction. Native Americans are suffering devastating losses. We heard the criticisms after running our reports on Seattle City Lights' extremely controversial claims that their dams on the Skagit River don't hurt fish. Dozens of viewers and online readers told us it's not the dams killing salmon runs, but the Native Americans. One wrote, it's the gill nets wiping out the salmon from local tribes. It's always been the problem. Another said, maybe they shouldn't net the river. Their ancestors didn't buy gas boats and nets. They're the ones who ruined the steelhead run by over netting the river. Another viewer wrote, get the nets out of the water. What would you say to that when you hear people saying, it's all the Indians fault? I'd say honestly, they have it exactly backwards. Kelly so, Suzuwind so is the director of the Washington State, State Department of Fish and Wildlife. He says it's not a free-for-all for the Native Americans on the rivers. They fish according to the law. That non-Native fishers and Native Americans split 50-50, a determined number of fish, if any, that can be taken during each run. The data of what's caught is shared with the state. That's supported by the courts. You know, if you get 10 fish and I get 10 fish, that's where we stop. I can catch mine by a hook and line, a troller or a saner or a gill net. That's their right. That's their uh, choice. 
The right to use nets is rooted in the 1855 Treaty of Point Elliot that says the right of taking fish at usual and accustomed grounds and stations is further secured to said Indians. We endeavor not to tell each other how to fish, just manage how many fish we're impacting and, and split that up. It's traditionally told by all our people that we only take what we need. We do not take more than what we need. Marilyn Scott is an Upper Skagit Indian Tribe elder and member of the Tribal Council. For thousands of years, her ancestors fished on the Skagit for nutritional, spiritual, and cultural needs. But according to fisheries managers, in recent years, the tribe has barely fished at all, just a few days a year to help with salmon recovery. Despite that, she says, they still get blamed. Now the things that the people say is in the general population is that those damn Indians, they're out there fishing. They get to fish whenever they want to fish. They get free money from the government. We don't get free money from the government. We all have to do what we do to survive. And we can't even do that now. What the tribe can't do is exercise their treaty right of fishing as they have historically, and they want Seattle to help by mitigating for the harm caused by their dams. The structures sit on the Upper Skagit's sacred ancestral lands and block miles of habitat for salmon. But we've heard from viewers who don't think the treaties still have value. One online reader said to tear up those damn things. I hear a lot of rhetoric about we gave the tribes too much in the treaties. And in reality, we gave the tribes nothing in the treaties. The treaties were a transfer of rights from the tribes to the government. And for that trade, basically all this beautiful land in the Pacific Northwest was given away by the tribes to the government. They reserved rights. They maintained rights they already had to hunt, fish, and gather in common with us. So that's a 150-year-old right. 35 years ago, Congress changed the game for federally licensed hydroelectric projects. No longer could utilities reap the rewards of generating power and simply leave behind the environmental fallout. Now a license had to require utilities to protect, mitigate, and enhance fish and wildlife affected by the operation. Under the new rules, as licenses came up for renewal, utilities in the Northwest got busy building, putting in infrastructure to help fish get above and below their dams, and building meant spending. On the Columbia, Grant County PUD invested $600 million on fish passage, and Douglas County PUD spent $188 million. On the Cowlitz, Tacoma Power shelled out $40 million. At the bottom of the list, Seattle City Light, on the Skagit. In the last 25 years for salmon recovery, they've invested about $12 million. When I saw the fairly dismal level of investment in protecting the salmon, it was disappointing. Lisa Janicki is a Skagit County Commissioner. She represents the region most affected by what happens on the Skagit River. Since the feds last relicensed Seattle's dams in 1995, Three species of Skagit fish have landed on the endangered species list. Bull trout, steelhead, and Chinook salmon, all headed toward extinction. If the people living in Seattle understood how little they were contributing to the salmon recovery efforts, they would be astounded. What has Seattle done with its $12 million contribution? In the Skagit watershed, the utilities bought more than 13,400 acres of conservation land. They've developed and restored salmon habitat and teamed up with government and tribal scientists on multi-million dollar research projects. Here's what City Light hasn't done, built fish passage, ladders or another way of helping salmon get around their dams to access additional miles of habitat. And that explains why their investment is so much lower. Up until five months ago, the utility wouldn't even consider studying the idea of fish passage. For decades, Seattle has said investing in fish passage would be a waste. Their dams, they say, were built above big boulders and falls that salmon can't get past anyway. But now, tribal and natural resource agency scientists 
aren't buying it, saying Seattle's natural fish barrier theory doesn't hold up and that realistic science is what's needed for a new license that could last up to 50 years. The Skagit can't take 50 more years of this. Our salmon are headed for extinction. Will Honey is Skagit County's natural resources attorney. His team concludes that per megawatt, Seattle has invested 37 times less than the Pacific Northwest average to help salmon recover. It's outrageous. That's not environmental justice. We have to do this together. And Seattle is just not contributing at a reasonable level. And that seems fairly inconsistent with the moral authority they claim on environmental issues quite frequently. I think a better comparison will be to look at what is our investment level post relicense compared with others because I don't think it's quite fair to compare a recently relicensed project with something that was relicensed or last licensed so many years ago. Deborah Smith is the CEO of Seattle City Light. She says it's not right to compare them to other utilities because Seattle holds the oldest license in the region, signed in 1995. Since then, environmental laws have tightened and licenses would naturally require more money. Smith also says under the new license, the utility is prepared to do its part. Again, um, no interest in being in being uh, you know on the cheap here. We want to do the right things. We want to follow the science. We'll be able to negotiate for the specific terms of the license in ways that are meaningful um, and responsive to the concerns of all the folks who, who count on the river and the, the watershed for their livelihood and for um, their lifestyle. Critics say while Seattle was tight-fisted on salmon spending, the public utility went on a spending spree on bloated projects. In 2016, City Light went $43 million over budget on a new billing computer program. In 2018, the utility spent $17.4 million more than planned on an updated metering system. The same year, Seattle's uber-modern Denny substation opened with a tab of $210 million, nearly $100 million over budget. <laughs> That's partly due to fancy add-ons such as an off-leash dog park and an interpretive elevated walkway that boasts Seattle City Light is the nation's greenest utility. I was frustrated because I knew that they had wasted a lot of money on other projects. Todd Myers is the director for the Center of the Environment at the Washington Policy Center and a member of the Puget Sound Salmon Recovery Council. The problem is when they waste tens of millions of dollars on frivolous amenities for a substation rather than helping salmon, that doesn't make any sense. I don't think we can compare the cost of a substation with the investment in a species. For me, one is bricks and mortar and the other is a species who, with people whose livelihoods and lifestyle depend on them. So I would never attempt to compare the two. Do I see City Light building another $210 million substation? Um, no, I do not, and certainly not while I'm at the city. Skagit County leaders say they're relying on City Light to do the right thing, to invest in their river, the heartbeat of the Skagit Basin that helps keep the lights on in Seattle. It's not too late. Seattle City Light can change their approach. They have to step up and take responsibility, and this is the time to do it. It's one of the greatest symbols of the Pacific Northwest, the beloved southern resident killer whale, orcas, who spend time year-round in Puget Sound. It's a spectacular species on the brink of extinction, signaling the demise of much more, including endangered Chinook salmon, the orca's main food source and the cultural traditions of indigenous people, like the Soxhuatl Indian tribe of the Skagit Basin. They are salmon people who, like the orca, are suffering from the loss of Chinook. Their dances are a healing practice, a way to honor all animals on Earth, including southern resident orcas. It's been a way of life. Nino Maltos is the chairman of the Soxhuatl tribe. The orca whales to us, we see them as our brothers and sisters of the water in the sense that we're, we're fighting for the same thing. We're fighting for a food source. We're fighting for a way of life. And the only difference between us and them is that we have a voice and they don't. So what does the Skagit River and the dams in it have to do with the health of the orca out here in the Salish Sea? 
a lot. The Skagit River produces more Chinook salmon for the orca than any other river in Puget Sound. But tribal and government scientists say the river could produce a lot more fish for whales if Seattle City Light would buck up and do its part. In a six-month investigation, King 5 has exposed that City Light has touted a narrative for decades that their dams don't hurt Chinook salmon, the prize meal for orcas because they were built above nature-made fish barriers. But we found the entire Pacific Northwest scientific community doesn't believe that story anymore. In public documents, Upper Skagit Indian tribe biologists wrote that's a false narrative. And the federal agency, NOAA Fisheries, wrote Big rocks aren't to blame for blocking fish, but the dam is the conclusive barrier to salmon getting upstream. Noah also wrote, the Skagit River is among the most important sources of Chinook needed for the recovery of orcas. Well, I think the entire public was misled. The orca community went along with that. Howard Garrett is the founder of the Orca Network based on Whidbey Island. He says there's been a lost opportunity on the Skagit that fish passage through the dams like fish ladders to help Chinook access miles of blocked off habitat could be a key benefit for the starving whales. There's been this kind of cover up and now we're seeing it was wrong and it has deprived us, us humans and certainly the tribes and especially to me, the orcas of their essential sustenance. Was it intentional? Of course it wasn't intentional, Susanna. Deborah Smith is the general manager and CEO of Seattle City Light. No misleading intended. I think most knowledge in this world is cumulative. Uh, we learn, we grow, we study, we learn some more, we grow, we study, and that's where we are right now. Below their hydroelectric dams, the utility is focused on helping salmon through habitat restoration. But that plan hasn't improved outcomes for fish or the whales. In 2005, the federal government listed the orca as an endangered species, but they're not recovering. The population grew to a high of 89 whales in 2006 to just 74 alive now. The main problem Southern residents are facing is a lack of food. Dr. David Bain is the chief scientist for the Seattle-based Orca Conservancy. He says restoration projects help, but the fastest route to help the whales is to access new habitat for Chinook. And there's a lot of high quality habitat above the dams that if the fish could reach them, you know, we could see much larger production out in Skagit. In 2018, this whale named J35 or Tahlequah brought international attention to the plight of the Pacific Northwest Orca. Tahlequah carried her dead calf throughout the Salish Sea for 17 days, an unprecedented showing of grief over the death of her baby. J35 Tahlequah certainly showed everyone what happens when they don't get enough to eat. So every little bit, every morsel, every every new source of Chinook salmon especially that you can bring into their habitat is going to help her and all the other southern residents. Seattle City Light says they're working to change conditions on the Skagit for salmon and the orcas who depend on the river. I think we all have a role to play and so we're committed to doing our part and continuing to learn more as we all are about what has put this species in peril and how we can help bring it back. I don't care about being right. Um, I care about doing right. I think it's a lot of talk. I think actions speak louder, louder than words. No one has more at stake than Native Americans who've called the Skagit Valley home for thousands of years. They're watching salmon, the very center of their culture, disappear, and in turn, the cherished orca. I believe that the Skagit River is taking care of Seattle City Lights financially and in every which way, and I think that it's Seattle City Lights time to take care of the Skagit River. A high wall hydroelectric dam like this one on the Baker River would spell imminent death to most young salmon trying to make their way down the river and then out to the ocean. But just before the drop off, you can see a portion of one of the most sophisticated operations in the country to keep those fish alive. 
It's Puget Sound Energy's fish passage system designed to allow salmon, specifically Baker sockeye, to access miles of habitat the utility's two dams once mostly blocked off. It's a tremendous success story. Ron Roberts is the vice president of energy supply for Puget Sound Energy, or PSC. For their last license on the Baker 20 years ago, the utility invested a whopping $170 million for fish on the brink of dying out. One of our big values is we do the right thing. And to me, Baker River is a great example of doing the right thing. PSC built its first Baker Dam to generate electricity in 1925. And right off the bat, the company worked to mitigate for the harm they brought to the ecosystem, starting with fish ladders, aerial trams carrying sockeye, and other technologies. But nothing worked well enough to get the species back on its feet. This run for years, a uh, period of 70 years, averaged around 3,500 and then uh, fell down to a low of 99 in 1985 and really was on the, the brink of uh, extinction. Arnie Asplund is PSC's senior resource scientist. He led the aquatics team through the last federal relicensing that came up with a new plan. And this is the outcome. From that dismal low point of 99 adult sockeye coming back in 1985, the run increased to a record 32,700 returning five years ago. Numbers never seen before. The process has been uh, very, very fulfilling. By working with stakeholders, including Skagit Valley tribes and state and federal resource managers, this is what PSC devised on the Baker. They use guide nets to move young fish into what are called floating surface collectors. We funnel them into holding tanks with each fish counted by hand before loading them into a massive steel crate. They boat the box of fish to shore, then truck them around the dam. After that, they spit the fish into tanks for resting. And this is the last move. They shoot the juvenile fish through a pipe back into the baker, where they can swim down river and out to sea. Adult fish are helped in a similar way as they come back to spawn. It was huge for the tribe. Scott Schuyler of the Upper Skagit Indian Tribe was the lead negotiator with PSC on the Baker Project. And he's leading the tribe's effort right now in the relicensing of Seattle City Lights dams on the Skagit. Schuyler says while PSC looked for solutions for their impacts, so far, Seattle City Lights Light is focused on denying or questioning the impact their project has on struggling salmon. It's been a lot more difficult and we don't think there's the, the, the same openness or willingness to accept uh, responsibility for, for past harms, if you would, and that, that we, we saw dealing with the other utility. We've made a lot of changes and we are really committed to doing things differently than we were up until January of this year. City Light so, CEO Deborah Smith has apologized to stakeholders for the utility's first two years of rocky negotiations and promises to continue with a new approach to find common ground. I'm glad for the Upper Skagit that they, that they had a good experience working with PSC on the Baker Project. And I hope that a couple of years from now, they'll look back and they'll say, boy, Boy, it was a rough start, but we wound up really having a good process with Seattle City Light. After years of sitting on the banks of the Baker, for the Upper Skagit tribe, the return of sockeye means a return to practicing their treaty right to fish. This year, it's the only river in the region producing enough sockeye to do so. This is the sole uh, bright spot in Puget Sound and, and on the west coast, I believe, where you have a little bit of harvestable fish and you can thank the uh, utility working with the agencies, the tribes to develop this uh, enhancement program. We align with the values we believe our customers adhere to, that salmon are a culture of the Northwest. They're an extremely important piece of tribal culture. It's everyone pulling in the same direction, really, that uh, delivers the kind of results that we're seeing. This is one of the smallest Indian tribes in the state of Washington, the Sox Suatl tribe of the Skagit Valley. Their tiny reservation is located near Darrington, about 350 members total. 
small but resolute, they've just slapped this lawsuit against Seattle City Light, saying since their dams block the passage of migrating fish, the operation goes against the Washington State Constitution. It's a David versus Goliath story the tribe says they're ready to take on. We're not backing down. Nino Maltos is the chairman of the Soxhawatl tribe. It can definitely, you know, seem intimidating, but to us, you know, win or lose, it shows that this is such an important thing to us that, that we're willing to take any means, go up against the biggest companies to, to make this happen and to mitigate these fish, get these passages in that should have been there from, from the beginning. Seattle's dams on the Skagit generate about 20% of the city's electricity. It's one of the only federally licensed hydroelectric projects in the region without a way to get salmon around their dams. On the Skagit, about 40% of spawning and rearing habitat is permanently blocked by Seattle's dams. As a council member, as the chairman of the tribe, I, I feel it's important to protect our, our natural resources by any means possible. The U.S. Congress appeared to be on the same page when they established the territory of Oregon and then Washington. In 1848, the Oregon Territorial Act included laws to protect salmon from dams. The rivers and streams in which salmon are found, lawmakers wrote, shall not be obstructed by dams unless they're constructed to allow salmon to pass freely. That was a requirement that you not block salmon streams. Jack Feinder is a member of the Yakima Nation and serves as the Sox Suattles attorney. You know what they meant back then, don't block the stream, we rely on the salmon for food and our economy and we've seen what happened before. As part of a new license to operate their dams, City Light has not committed to installing fish passage, but they've agreed to study the possibility of doing so. The Sox Suattle argue the utility doesn't have a choice, that the laws forming the territories, including the mandate for fish passage, carry forward into the state constitution. And here it is, Article 27 states, all laws now in force in the territory of Washington shall remain in force unless they're repealed by the legislature. How important is that document if we are looking at history and not wanting to forget our history? Well, it's very important because that same document formed the basis for the government of this region. It's what the framers intended. With Chinook salmon at the center of Soxhawatl culture and on the brink of extinction, tribal leaders say the lawsuit should send a message. It's time for the city of Seattle to take their concerns seriously and that so far, that hasn't happened. It just adds to the historic pain as far as the Soxhawatl tribe, what they've ex experienced, having their voice not heard for so long. We have so much at stake. We have... Uh, the, the possible extinction of the king salmon and the effects that will have on our future generations of fishermen and uh, not, not only our fishermen, uh, everybody that, that uh, benefits off the fish that come out of the Skagit River. On Indigenous Peoples Day, Native Americans and supporters called in the city of Seattle to do better to support tribal rights on the Skagit River. Our salmon are part of our treaty rights. Our waters are part of our treaty rights. Seattle has generated hydroelectricity from the Skagit for 100 years. Their three dams do not include any way for salmon to get around the structures, blocking off hundreds of miles of habitat salmon are in dire need of. But Seattle's been telling a different story. The King 5 investigators have shown that for decades, Seattle City Light has denied their dams have any impact on salmon. Protesters showed what they think about that with signs such as Seattle lied, salmon died, and Seattle fix your damn dams. For far too long, Indian people have been pushed down, cast aside like we're nothing or we didn't mean anything to anyone. And I like the fact that Sox Waddle has engaged in a huge fight. The Soxhawatl and two other Skagit Valley tribes say the dams put their treaty rights at risk because in exchange for handing over all their land, the government made a promise, a guarantee, that Indians would continue to fish as they have since time immemorial. But with salmon sliding toward extinction, tribal members rarely get to fish as they used to. 
I think it's absolutely despicable. I think it's one more example of the thousands and millions of examples of where money and power and light come before people. City Light is getting its Skagit dams relicensed by the federal government. Under a new license, the tribes want a fish passage system installed. City Light says it's studying the idea and that science will tell them if they have to. Hi, hi. Members of several tribes showed up in solidarity today. The Yakima Nation, the Lummi Nation, the Standing Rock Sioux, the San Carlos Apache of Arizona, the Puyallup, and the Chinook Nation of Oregon. Their message to the city, even if it's not a requirement, build a way for salmon to get past the dams, no matter what. The salmon don't have cell phones. They they can't call a legislator. They, they can't call anyone for help. It's up to us. We have to be their voice. The city of Seattle is known across the U.S. as a guru of green. For 100 years on the Skagit River, the city's generated electricity by operating three dams. And by the national gold standard, that project's an environmental success story. The Low Impact Hydropower Institute, or LEHI, gives it a green certification, the largest project in the country with this prestigious designation. That really is, is the bar to reach. Chris Townsend is a top environmental executive at Seattle City Light. And we hope to maintain that and be a leader uh, for uh, the rest of the country, really. To be green, Leahy mandates specific requirements, including this important one, fish passage, meaning the project must engineer a way for fish to get around their dams. But Seattle's dams don't meet that mark. The city has never invested in fish passage. The dams cut off nearly 40% of the river habitat to salmon species, including three on the brink of extinction, bull trout, steelhead, and Chinook salmon. So how did the city of Seattle, without fish passage, manage to earn that green superstar status? Several groups in the Skagit Valley, including tribes, say the city got around it by supplying Leahy with misinformation, falsehoods, and selective science. In Seattle's original Leahy application in 2002, and in two more for green recertifications, the utility leaned on this science from 1921, 100 years old, that showed salmon never physically made it up to where the dams are located anyway, so fish passage isn't necessary. The researchers said below Gorge Dam, salmon couldn't navigate these steep canyons, turbulent rapids, and rugged falls. That would be saying, like, uh, it never rains here in Seattle. Robert Howard is the general manager of the Soxhawatl Indian tribe located in the Skagit Valley. The tribe has filed a lawsuit against the city for allegedly deceiving them and the public about natural fish barriers the tribe doesn't believe exist. Even though we are so small, just about 300, we're mighty in nature, enough so to stand up to a big bully in the playground. In the three green applications to Leahy, City Light references the natural fish barriers 54 times. Here's what City Light didn't highlight. Page one of the 1921 science that states, the survey must be considered as superficial. It would take very much more time for a thorough investigation. And last year, natural resource agencies in the region agreed in public documents that the fish barrier theory is bogus, including the National Park Service. They wrote they haven't found any evidence of a fish passage barrier. And NOAA Fisheries wrote it's not boulders and falls, but the dam is the conclusive barrier for salmon to access upstream habitat. Seattle, you're better than this. Skagit County Commissioner Peter Browning. We were a little outraged at that because the certification meant clearly a lot to them, but they have to be honest. And in this case, they weren't being. We stated what we knew to be true. Seattle City Light says they gave Leahy the best science they had and that studies they're doing on the river right now could change their direction. Just because it's a different river now or we have different ways of understanding what the truth is doesn't mean that we were untruthful previously. It means that we did the best job we could given the information we had. The Upper Skagit Indian Tribe says they found evidence their sacred salmon can swim up past the falls of the river, but that every time that's happened, they say City Light has discredited their findings. So you feel like you have that proof now? 
Yes, most definitely. Here's what's new. This year, government scientists made a discovery biologists consider a game changer. Tiny fish they believed were coho, some of the weakest swimmers in the Skagit, found in a place City Light says adult coho couldn't possibly swim to or spawn in. For 17 years, John Paul Shanahan was the managing biologist for the Upper Skagit Indian tribe. So if a coho made it, that's definite proof that Chinook, steelhead, bull trout, and other fish would make it up there. To make sure, samples were sent to the state lab to test for DNA. What did it say? It said coho. <laughs> yeah. And that was a good day? That was a great day. Several Skagit River stakeholders tell us if City Light wants to hold on to its certification and keep claiming it's the nation's greenest utility, they need to do a lot more to help salmon make a comeback on the Skagit and ditch the story their project doesn't hurt fish. This information, was it used deceitful? Was it misleading? Or was it half-truths? I don't know. I think accepting what it is and moving forward is what the resource needs and what the people who care about this stuff need. The Soxhoatl tribe has very little resources. We're out here in the North Cascades. We're still in COVID, but we have no casino. Tribes of the Skagit Valley, including the tiny Soxhoatl, are rural, poor, and struggling to compete with the deep pockets of a big city utility doing business in their backyard. The tribes say the system is stacked against them, with Seattle's ability to hire top-tier consultants and attorneys to protect the city's interests. The King 5 investigators have found that so far on the preliminary process, Seattle has spent nearly $30 million dollars, the vast majority for science, but also for meeting facilitators, strategic communications, and attorneys. High-priced lawyers charging between $500 and $700 an hour. Just to avoid doing the right thing, when they could, they could have taken that and applied it to something equitable, something fair, something that sustains the environment and takes care of the salmon. You know, that's That's hard to understand. Robert Howard is the general manager of the Sox Suattle tribe. I um, equate it to something for the standpoint of, of bringing in higher guns, you know, um, which I'm sure is their job. But we're a small tribe. Our total tribal budget is a fraction of that. And yet we're standing up. And yet we're trying to do something from our standpoint for the greater good of everybody. Do you feel as though City Light has been good stewards of these taxpayer dollars yes. and what you've spent so far? Um, yes. City Light CEO Deborah Smith says the city is spending what's necessary in a complicated legal process. But she admits the first two years of negotiations, endless Zoom meetings were fraught with conflict and lack of progress, with the utility doing a poor job of listening to stakeholders. Clearly, things were not going the way we needed to. Um, were those dollars that were being spent at that time being spent in the most productive way? No. That's why we made the change that we made. And now I feel like we're in a very good place. We're being frugal, we're being careful. Since the dam relicensing began in 2018, the city's been spending and asking for money. In that time, the state of Washington awarded Seattle City Light grants worth nearly $4 million, money to buy conservation land around the river. Critics say that takes away from other projects sponsored by groups strapped for cash. In the time Seattle got $4 million, records show the state didn't fund dozens of other salmon projects, including grants proposed by the Lummi Nation, the Nez Perce Tribe, and the Nisqually Land Trust. So unfortunately, what happens in Seattle doesn't stay in Seattle. It impacts the whole state, costing taxpayers and salmon uh, in projects that don't get done elsewhere. Todd Myers is the Washington Policy Center's environmental director and a member of the Puget Sound Salmon Recovery Council. Other parts of the state, rural areas, where salmon recovery and salmon projects are very important, they don't have those deep pockets. So when you take money away from the state that could go to those places, you are really doubly harming um, areas that desperately need that money and where salmon need the habitat. 
City Lights top boss says the utility does not have unlimited piles of money and won't apologize for accepting state funding she says they're entitled to. I don't feel bad about applying for those types of grants. We don't always get them. Um, there's probably far more instances where we didn't get them and where we've wondered the same thing. Wow, how come we, how come we weren't successful? But when we are, um, I feel like that's a good thing and we'll continue to do so. Seattle plans to spend a lot more to get their dams relicensed, with a total budget of nearly $70 million. <laughs> Tribal members say they're in it for the long haul. That there's no price you can put on the Skagit River and the salmon who call it home. You can spend a billion dollars on this issue, and we're still going to fight as long as it's going to take to ensure that the world knows about what's happening here to ensure that the local stakeholders and just common folks understand what's right. Oh, oh.